Good morning. Uh, welcome to Cornerstone Church. Tell you what, uh, I believe that God's presence is alive and active in this place today. Amen. I'm just, I'm just like, I'm sitting here singing and worshiping, and I'm anticipating what I believe God wants to do in your heart today and in your life today. I, uh, we've been planning and praying for this service for weeks and months, and I believe that God has something for you here today. Uh, if you have a smartphone or a tablet, feel free to go to Bible.com. Get on our guest Wi-Fi and download the app there. You can follow along in your uh, on your device there. We've got some extra links and some sermon notes there in the event area of that uh, Bible app. I encourage you to be a part of that and to join in with that. Uh, I need to make uh, an announcement today. We made an announcement a few weeks ago, but I need to make really not an, an announcement, an introduction, really. Um, we have our new associate pastor here with us, uh, Pastor Kermit Barker and his wife Nikki are here. We welcome them right, right here on the front row. Um, we're going to uh, give them a quiz next Sunday to see if he can remember all of our names. So uh, he's, he's trying, but if you'll be gracious with him, I'm sure uh, he's, he's really excited to get to know you. So take a few minutes and welcome him and say hello to him if you would. Uh, I want to encourage you, if you haven't been here for the other Sundays of this month, to go back online and to get caught up. Because this month at Cornerstone, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. And uh, this is the fourth, the fourth Sunday in this series of messages. And uh, each of the other messages kind of build to get us to the point that we're at today. So if you haven't been here, you can simply go to BethaltoChurch.com, and we have audio and video located there for you to be able to consume however you want. You can get it in your podcast app. You can go on and just stream it from your device. Uh, And we are, speaking of streaming, we are streaming our services on video right now. So if anyone is watching, uh, we want to welcome you today. We can like clap for them or something and say hi. We've had several people. Uh, from all across the states, so we had—I think we had some people on vacation in Florida a few weeks ago because we had some people from Florida watching. Uh, but we do this because we want to spread God's word all around, and we want to communicate what God has done inside of us. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I came across a video on YouTube, and it was from a guy who has a YouTube channel all about cinema, all about movies and film, and he kind of. Uh, observes film. He talks about how different directors use camera angles and how they develop their stories. And in this particular video that he created, it was all about introductions of different characters on film. And he talked about when directors are introducing one of their characters in a movie, uh, a good director is very careful about how they introduce that character. Because The way they introduce somebody is often telling about not only who that person is, but it can even give you insight into what that film is all about. And this was made, I don't know, a month or so ago, right around the time when Gene Wilder died. And so they, of course, showed one of the famous introduction scenes from one of his movies. And I just, it's about a minute and a half long, and I want to share that with us this morning. So if you guys can go ahead and roll that.
great clip, great movie. I want a golden goose, right? I love that movie. I love the songs. I love all the different aspects of that movie. But this is a great introduction to the character of Willy Wonka. Because if you're familiar with this movie, you know what the end of the movie reveals about him. So we have this introduction of Willy Wonka, and he comes out. He looks kind of like a feeble, maybe an older man, maybe eccentric. All these people have gathered to see him. They've, they've never seen him before, they're, and they're clapping. And all of a sudden, he comes out, and he's got this cane, and he's walking, and the crowd comes to a hush. And then what does he do? He tucks and rolls at the last minute, and he surprises them because, surprise, he didn't really need the cane all along. Now, if you know the movie, you know in the end that much of the movie is really a ruse. He's, he's just pretending all of these things are going on this contest. It's just a way for him to test these kids that he's invited into the chocolate factory to see who can run the factory after him. So this introduction to Willy Wonka, his character, with this deception and this kind of whimsy here, it's reflective of who Willy Wonka is all throughout the movie, and we really see that revealed in near the end of the movie when he reveals that it's kind of been putting on this game or this ploy the whole time. You know, this is true in fiction, in movies like this, but introductions are really important in real life as well, right? Uh, we have that famous expression, you only have one chance to give a good first impression. No pressure, Pastor Kermit, right? You have one chance to give a good first impression. Uh, when my wife and I first uh, got engaged, we were at college, and uh, my wife and I dated for a couple of years before we got engaged, but not all of my extended family had an opportunity to meet her. And so I took her around to introduce her to some of my family members, and we went over, I'm not going to say who, but I went over to one of my family members' houses, and um, we walked in the door, and I introduced, I said, so-and-so, this is my fiance, Bethany, and she walked up to Bethany, she kind of put her arms like on her shoulders, and, and she looked at her square in the eyes and said, is it too late to talk you out of it? <laughs> Very telling of an introduction to what her life is like and some of the frustrations in her life and some of the bitterness that she holds on to in her life. Introductions are incredibly important. And that's why I find it to be so fascinating to see how, in the Bible, John the Baptist chooses to introduce Jesus. Because for many of us, when we think of Jesus, we think of uh, different phrases like the Lamb of God. We think of the Son of God or the perfect sacrifice. But look at how John the Baptist introduces Jesus in Luke 3. He says this. He's being asked about, John, are you, the, are you the Messiah? Are you the Savior to come? John answered them all. I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. That's like the lowest job, the worst job. I'm not even worthy to do that. He says, Jesus, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Okay, so we know Jesus kind of as the Savior, as our sacrifice, and all these different things. But John doesn't mention that in his introduction to Jesus. He's telling us something really important about Jesus. Now, Luke tells us about this in his gospel, Luke, in the, in the gospel of Luke. But throughout the rest of the gospel of Luke, we don't see Jesus baptizing in this way. We don't see Jesus baptizing in the Holy Spirit. What is that? We don't see him baptizing in fire. I mean, okay, Holy Spirit, some figurative, but fire is the opposite of water, right? So what is this that Jesus is talking about? We don't see this at all throughout the book of Luke, throughout the gospel of Luke. But we do see it right at the beginning of the book of Acts. Now, for some of you, you've been in the church a long time. You know that Luke wrote the gospel of Luke, but he also wrote the book of Acts. And these are like part one, if you will, and part two. In fact, they overlap just a little bit. And right in the overlap, right around the time when Jesus ascends to heaven after he's died and after he's risen from the grave, right in the overlap there is when we find Jesus all of a sudden talking about being the baptizer. We find it in verses four and five of chapter one. He says this, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, this is Jesus, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So what John has done is John has introduced Jesus as the baptizer. 
Jesus has waited through all his, all his earthly ministry. He's performed miracles. He's died on the cross. He's risen from the grave. And then now finally he says, okay, now I'm going to identify myself as the baptizer. But we still don't know what this is. What does it mean to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and with fire? Jesus gives his disciples a little bit of a clue a couple of verses later in verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So this event, this baptism that Jesus uh, has been introduced as being the baptizer. And now he's saying I'm going to baptize. It has a couple of purposes for power and to be a witness. What we see next is the disciples are obedient to the command to wait in Jerusalem. So the rest of chapter 1 of Acts, we see the disciples go to Jerusalem. They gather together on a regular basis. They're praying with one another. They're waiting for this promise, this baptism that Jesus has given to them. In the meantime, Jesus ascends to heaven. So Jesus is no longer physically here on the earth when chapter 2 rolls around. And in chapter 2, verse 1, we have the day or the moment of the baptism of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Verse 1, chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came down to rest on each of them. Okay, there's a lot going on in these verses here. And as I was studying and looking, we could take weeks and weeks and weeks to pack, unpack all of the different layers of what's going on. I just want to highlight a couple of things that I think are most pertinent and most important to us today. First, Luke identifies this as happening on a very particular, in a very particular time frame. He says, on the day of Pentecost. Now, for us today in the room, when we say Pentecost, uh, a lot of us in the room are going to think of a particular style of worship. We might think of Pentecostal theology. We might think about healings or speaking in tongues. We might have these ideas of what it means to be Pentecostal. When Luke wrote this, uh, right at the beginning of the, set of the, of the first century, he is, he's not talking about what we think of when we say Pentecost. Because Pentecost was actually a festival. It was a celebration that the Jewish people had. It was like a holiday. And during Pentecost, they did a variety of different uh, rituals and they had a variety of different aspects to it. But the main thing, or one of the main things that they celebrated was they looked back at their history to Exodus chapter 19 when Moses received the law on the mountain. Anybody seen those movies? You know, Charleston, Charlton Heston, the Ten Commandments and all those. This is, that's what they're remembering. They're remembering Moses going up Mount Sinai. And they're remembering that he came back down with tablets, God's law, written on stone. Do you remember what took place while Moses was on the mountain? Do you remember what else was on the mountain? There was fire, and there was smoke, and there was the sound of thunder. So do you see the parallels of what's going on here? Not only is this happening on the day of Pentecost when they remember what Moses did and remember God giving his law, but we also see right in the room there that day, we see uh, the sound like the blowing of a violent wind. And we see what seems to be tongues of fire, a, a fire coming down and separating on all of them there. What we're finding here on the day of Pentecost is this hearkening back or this Looking back, it's, it's, it's calling attention to the day that Moses went up the mountain and the time period he spent up on that mountain and then he came down with tablets of stone, God's law. Now, Jesus has just ascended, not up a mountain, but he's ascended up to heaven. And, and now what's going to happen in the next, and what's happening here in these verses is Jesus doesn't come back down, but the Holy Spirit comes down. And he doesn't come down with tablets of stone, but instead the Holy Spirit comes down with the way that one theologian put it, with the dynamic energy of the law designed to be written on human hearts. What's happening with this, what looks like fire and what seems to be fire, and it's separating and it's going down, it's indicating that the Holy Spirit is going to dwell within each and every individual believer in power. The same kind of power and the presence of, the whole, of, of God that was seen on the mountain, what now is happening, that same power and presence is present in the believer. It's, 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 it's not something that's just, 
Oh, Moses is up there and we're here. What? Where was the smoke and the fire back in the Old Testament? On the mountain. <laughs> Luke is saying, like, we're the mountain now. His presence is in us. His presence is among us. He's coming down to empower you. Now, these are the signs. This is what's pointing towards what's taking place. What I want to do over the next several moments here is I want to look at the moment of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I want to look at some of the marks or the reactions or the results of what the Holy, the baptism of the Holy Spirit does for the believer in us. And the first thing that we see here, it's a little redundant, but let's look, look at this here. The baptism in the Holy Spirit fills you with the Spirit. The baptism in the Holy Spirit fills you with the Spirit. Verse 4 says, All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So when you baptize someone, that word means to immerse or to submerge. And so the idea of being filled with the Holy Spirit or baptizing the Holy Spirit means we are filled, we are immersed to overflowing. So the baptism is about getting a measure of God's presence in your life that is overflowing and overwhelming. Notice on the screen here, it says that all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. Not some of them. All of them were filled. And who were these people that were there in that room? They were disciples. They were believers. If you're here today and you call yourself a believer, you qualify to receive this gift. In fact, Jesus has called you to ask for it and to wait for it and to seek it. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. Later, Peter gets up because there's a crowd that gathers. Later in this chapter, Peter gets up and in verse 39, he says this whole thing that's happening, this baptism here. He says, this promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Today, church, if you call yourself a believer in Jesus, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus or a Christian or whatever title you want to use, uh, this gift is something that is intended for you. This fullness of his presence is, is intended for you to experience it in, in your life. What it says then, after this, is that they all began to speak in other tongues. Now, this is where people, some people get a little nervous about this. Like, okay, what's that all about? What's going on there? Um, I don't have, I'm not going to take a lot of time to talk about why and what with the speaking in tongues. Because, for our purposes today, the focus that we have is on being filled with the Spirit. Speaking in tongues is the evidence or the result that takes place after that. Does that make sense? Speaking in tongues is important, in, but only in that it's the evidence of what the more important thing has taken place, which is the filling of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we get it turned around, right? The reason I mention this is because at the end of service, we're going to have an opportunity for you to come forward to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and to pray and to seek. And what happens because I've, I've, I've grown up in a Pentecostal church. I've, I've been through this. I've been at camp meetings. I've been in services. What happens often is people come forward and they're like, I want that tongue thing. I want that sign. I want that power thing. I want that tongue thing. And what they're doing is they're putting the gift in front of the giver. And we want to focus on the giver. Remember, the Holy Spirit is a person. And we want his presence. We want him. And when we get that, then there's the benefit of the gift that comes, the tongues that come after that. But we want to seek the Holy Spirit, and we want His presence in our lives. Uh, my wife uh, had a birthday uh, this past uh, week on Friday, and I got her a gift. I got her. I, I, I made it. Guys, you understand my pain, right? I got her. Uh, I got her boots. I got her clothing, and that is like, like I don't know what I was thinking because she opened them and she loved them. But they're not the right size. <laughs> they're not the right style. So we got to return them, right? So, but here's the thing. Like if my wife had it mixed up, she would be more concerned about the gift. But in this case, she was just grateful that the giver was thoughtful and got something that, you know, she, that was close to what she wanted, right? And so we want to have the same mindset. Yeah, right. You, you talk to her about that. She actually, I think, really liked it. I hope. The point is, we want to make sure that we don't get the giver and the gift mixed up. Because that happens a lot of times for us. So when we talk about this today, our intent and our purpose is to talk about the giver. We want the Holy Spirit, His presence in our lives. That's what we want to focus on. Second, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. What happens when you're filled with the Spirit, uh, we have this incredible experience. We speak in tongues, but what happens is we are thrust or driven into the world. Listen to what happens here in verses 5 and 6, and then in verse 14. Now there were staying in Jerusalem 
God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, because apparently the meeting was so loud that they heard all of this, the speaking in tongues and the rushing wind. When they heard this sound, a crowd came to gather, or came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Do you, do you remember what Jesus said in Acts 1, verse 8, about the baptism? He said it is to receive power to witness. And that's what's taking place. You know, one of the dangers of the Pentecostal church is that we can become so enamored with the supernatural that we want to stop there. One of the dangers of being in a Pentecostal church or a Pentecostal experience is we want that like upper room or that house experience with the, with the fire. We want the tongues and we want this emotional experience and we just want to stop there. But church, uh, you know, look, I, I, I've grown up, like I said, in an Assemblies of God church. Uh, you know, I'm a pastor. I don't know what you do on vacation. But when I go on vacation, I'm checking out other churches because I want to see how they do things, right? I want to learn from them. I go to church when I'm on vacation and, and probably maybe on one hand in my life, I, I've not been in a Pentecostal church in my life growing up, okay? I mean, just for a vacation or whatever it was. And I'm telling you, I, I, you know, I've gone to Bible college where I met people from all across the country and I'm a part of this and I've seen some, some dangers and some problems that we sometimes can face as Pentecostal people. And one of the dangers that we face is elitism. Look, I, I've met a lot of Pentecostal Christians who think they are better than other believers. There, there, was, a, there was a phrase that we used to use a lot. We don't use it as much anymore, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. Uh, I know what we meant by it. We would say we're a full gospel church. And I know what we mean. We mean that we preach about the baptism, and I understand that. But I've got to be honest, it kind of comes across as arrogant. Like, like we're better than you or something. And, and look, church... The point I'm trying to make is the baptism in the Holy Spirit doesn't make you better than someone else. It makes you a better you. The baptism in the Holy Spirit isn't about putting people on a spiritual hierarchy and I'm better than you and I've got this and you don't. It's about you being a better you. It's about optimizing who you are so you can most effectively do what God's caused you to to do. So this spiritual elitism like we really know how to do church. Or you got to come to our church so you can get what we have. No, no. We, you really, we really know how to worship. We really know how to pray. No, the baptism in the Holy Spirit doesn't make you better than someone else. It makes you a better you. It's about making yourself more available to the Spirit. So elitism is a problem that we can face. But another danger that we face is isolationism. Now, look, we don't want to be tainted by this world. We want to be separate, right? We want to be holy, our, our, our church, the Pentecostal church, comes out of something called the holiness movement. We're like, it was all about rules and what you couldn't do. And if you broke a rule, man, you were just done and you were out. Now, church, I'm not saying that we need to be light on holiness. We absolutely need to live holy lives. But what happens sometimes is church becomes this spiritual holy huddle where we get our spiritual buzz. We come here to hide out from the world and then we go back into our homes and we hide out. Instead of living a spirit-empowered life, we opt for separating ourselves from the world. But what happens is we become completely ineffective because we have no engagement with the lost. Church, the mark of Pentecost is that it will drive you into this world. The Spirit will never take you out of this world. The Spirit will always drive you into the world. Do you remember what happened when Jesus was baptized in water? John the Baptist baptizes him. Jesus is is there in the water and the Father speaks from heaven. This is my son. I'm well pleased. And then what happens? The dove comes down, descends on him. The The dove is the Holy Spirit, descends on him. And then right after Jesus is baptized, where does he go? He he goes away. He goes out into the wilderness. And that's what's happening here. They have this powerful church service. They have this powerful encounter with the Holy Spirit. I mean, things are really rocking and rolling. The service is coming to a crescendo. Things are just getting great. And instead of staying there, they shut the meeting down and they go outside. Because the Holy Spirit will always drive you out into this world. Because our job, the purpose is to have boldness to go and to be witnesses. We're powered, empowered to do this. Third, the baptism of the Holy Spirit empowers you to witness. Empowers you to witness. When they heard this sound, it says in verse 6, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, 
Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that each of us hear them in our own native language? And then verse 12. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They've had too much wine. I mean, look at the words that are, that are used in this passage. Bewilderment. Utterly amazed. They ask questions. Aren't all these? How is it? What does this mean? They're perplexed. Some even made fun of them. Church, an authentic move of the Spirit will bring about curiosity and misjudgment. It will cause attention and it will bring about curiosity and misjudgment. There will be people that will not understand what is going on. But others will be drawn with with curiosity. What does Peter do next? It's, It's fascinating how he addresses this. Verse 14. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. What does Peter do? He's in this incredible meeting. He's been baptized in the Holy Spirit. He's speaking in tongues. All of them are doing this. The sound of wind, what appears to be fire, is a powerful service. He goes out and then in his own language, he communicates with the people that have gathered there. He answers their questions. And even more than that, he's talking to a group of Jews that have gathered from all over different regions. And so what does he say? He uses the language that they would understand. He appeals to one of the Jewish prophets. He says, you want to know what's going on? Let me give you some context for this. You know about Joel. I'm going to talk to you about Joel. This is what's going on. You think that this thing is happening over here. You think this is crazy. You think that we're drunk. You think whatever. But I'm telling you, it's not that. It's this over here. And church, that is what our calling is. We are called, empowered by the Holy Spirit to go out into this world and say, you think this is it. But I'm telling you, it's actually this. You think that if you just indulge yourself with that substance, with that alcohol, or with, that, with those drugs, that that's going to give you some kind of satisfaction or some kind of peace in your life. You think that's it, but I'm telling you, this is what's going to give you satisfaction. A relationship with Jesus, the Holy Spirit filling your life. Don't fill your life with that substance. Fill your life with God's presence. You might think that that relationship is going to satisfy. You may think that if you can just find... Mm -mm -mm, The right man or the right woman, right? You can find somebody who's got money. If you can find somebody who just loves you the right way, if you can find somebody that that's going to happen. No, there is one who loves you more than you could ever ask, hope, think, or imagine. Jesus Christ. We stand in the world and we say, it's not this. No, it's this over here. We point out we are like spiritual tour guides in this world. Years ago, I went to Europe with some friends, and uh, we were in college. We were poor. We didn't have we like there were <laughs> near the end of the trip. We just kind of stopped eating. We had like one meal a day. It was really funny. One of my friends he had a breakdown. He was like, "I'm so hungry." He got mad at us, and so we had to anyway. But we were on this trip. We didn't have money for tour guides when we went to the different, uh, you know cathedrals and art museums and whatever. And I remember, you know, we would be, there would be a group there with all the same t-shirts on and we would kind of like slide over you know what I mean? and try to get a little bit of the tour guide to talk to us. And here we could kind of do it maybe for a painting or two or a statue or two. But I'm telling you, it was fascinating because we would just like walk past something and then we'd hear a tour guide pointing it out. Like, oh, Michelangelo made that. And this, and it, like, there were some statues we saw that didn't look finished. And I was like, why did they have those in there? Well, it was made a certain way to look unfinished. And it was like the person was breaking out of the stone. And like, I was like, I never knew that. That's an amazing piece of art that's sitting here right in front of me. And I just, I just walked past it. Church, when we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, we point those things out in the world. No, 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 no. Don't miss this. No, no, no. This is a big thing here. You need to be aware of this. There are times where where people, you don't even have to go out. A lot of times people will be curious and they'll be drawn to you. Man, there are times where people are going to come to you and they're going to say, look, this this season, this political season is crazy. Everything is up in arms. I think, think, you know, this is a problem for us. How do you have peace in the midst of all of this? And we say, oh, no, no, you don't understand. You're putting your trust and your confidence in a political system here in this world. 
And, you know, I involve myself in it, and I do my due diligence as a citizen, but I don't put my trust here. You know where I put my trust? I don't put my trust in a government. I put my trust in a kingdom <laughs> and in a king, and I put my hope in him. That's what it means to be empowered and filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yes, we have incredible times of supernatural experiences with him. There's this experience we can have where he fills us with his presence. And we speak in tongues and we can see healings and we can pray. We can hear a word from God. We can have these kinds of experiences, but we don't stop there. His spirit thrusts us out into the world so that we can boldly stand up and say, it's not this, it's that. This is what the promise is. This is what it means when Jesus says, I'm going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now. What I want us to do is I want to shift our shift gears a little bit here because I want us to kind of get to a point where we can we can pray and we can respond to this. Because what I've been praying for weeks now is that God today would do something really profound in every single individual's life here. I, my prayer is that every single person as a part of our church would be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, when when if I know there's a lot of people who already have been baptized, and and there's again. Strength of time, we're not going to talk about it, but we see in the book of Acts how there are multiple refillings that take place. There are times where people need to kind of just get around God's presence and say, God, would you fill me again with your presence? And so today, if you've been filled before, I want you to come forward in a minute or two, and we want to pray for you to be refilled with the baptism as well. But how do we just receive the baptism? I, I don't want this to be like a simple formula. Like if I just do these things then I'll be filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want to give us some direction arrows to move in. So a couple of thoughts for us as we're going to respond in a few minutes here. First, how do we receive the baptism? First, seek the gift, not the giver. It is such a critical part. If you're coming up here in a few minutes and be like, man, I want some supernatural power thing. I don't want to say sit down. Uh, Sit down, think about it, and then get the right motivation and then come on back down and be here because we want to focus on the giver. We want the Holy Spirit to, to, to speak in, into our lives. Second, repent and ask for forgiveness of sin. Uh, third, ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit for His glory. If you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit for your own glory or for some other reason, so you can say, hey, I got it and you don't, again, you're missing it. This is something that is done for His glory and for His purpose. Fourth, worship the Lord expressing praise and adoration. Throughout the book of Acts, when we see people that have been baptized in the Holy Spirit and being baptized in the Holy Spirit, there is often, not always, but there's often uh, an expression of praise or worship that is connected with that moment or that event. And so simply what we're asking in in a few minutes is come forward and just say, God, baptize me with your Holy Spirit and begin to worship and praise and, and give adoration and glory to God. And then last, yield to what God wants to express through you. Um, when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, it was in between my, uh, it was right, I, actually, I don't have, I, I was trying to think this morning, I was like, when was that exactly? It was right around my eighth grade year or my freshman year of high school. And uh, for whatever reason, uh, we had been talking about it a lot at church, and I had gone forward several different times to receive the baptism. Um, there was a, a retreat that I went to, and I remember praying for a long time, and I just never really Really felt anything, never really thought, they never had a kind of breakthrough or anything, nothing really happened. And this happened for several months where I would pray and it just didn't seem like anything was going to occur. And, and I'll never forget, it was a Sunday night at my church, uh, the church I grew up in in Naperville, Illinois. And I remember our pastor saying, he did a message on it, and on, on baptism of the Holy Spirit. And at the end, he said, I know there's people here that need to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I just want to invite you to come down and I want to pray for you. Now, in my church, it was a large church, but at my church, there were often people that would come forward to be prayed for. And so I just thought, I'll just wait for somebody else to go first. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that was one of those things. I'll just wait until somebody else goes up first. We sang that first song, and nobody moved. <laughs> I think we sang it another time. And nobody moved. And Pastor got up and he said, I know that there's people here that need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And it was at that moment that I realized, I was like, God, you're not making this easy for me today, today are you? <laughs> but I did. I went up. And I could, the building's not even there anymore. But I could probably get on that land. And I could probably show you about the same area where it was. And I could tell you it was just kind of in the side where I stood there. And I just, it was one of those things where I was like, I was so embarrassed to be the first one. But I kind of like 
Like, as I got up, I kind of closed my eyes. You know, I just was like, I just I put my head down. I just wanted to pray because I didn't want to be a focus of attention, but I just prayed. And I remember a few minutes later, opening my eyes, there was a lot of people around. That night, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, how do I know that? Because what happened when I was praying that night, and it's different for everybody. It's different for everybody. But for me, I just had, it wasn't even a feeling, really. There was just something, I, I say in my heart or in my spirit, and it, 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 was, it was not, like the Holy Spirit didn't take control of my tongue. Like I didn't go into some kind of uncontrollable thing. We don't believe that the Holy Spirit does that. There was just this, I don't know how else to say it, like a word or a phrase that was just impressed in my heart. And that's all it was. It was just like a word or a phrase. And the more I was, was there and resisting it, the more I realized that was it. And it was just a very natural thing. It was just this thing that was in my head or in my heart. But I felt like it was the spirit that was prompting it. And I just spoke it out. And when I did, there was, I, I, it wasn't even really a feeling, but it was like a relief. It was just this assuredness that I knew that God had baptized me in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are other people that, I mean, okay, I don't want to, I, I want to be careful because I know we're in Cardinals territory, but the Cubs, you know, we, the Cubs won last night. And my family, we're like really happy about this. And I watched the game last night, and even before the game was over, I saw people, and they would go to the crowd, tears streaming down their faces. You've got others, they're like hugging everybody, you got others cheering, jumping up and down. I mean, there are all sorts of different kinds of reactions to positive things, right? And I think it's the same way with the Holy Spirit. There are times where some of you, you may get up here, you may pray, and you may be just a mess. we got plenty of Kleenex for you. Others of you, maybe you're more intellectual or stoic or whatever, and it's just a matter of just, okay, that's it. I'm going to speak it, and we're good. And that's okay. We can't put God into a box. When we look, in fact, at all the different times in the book of Acts and how people are filled with the baptism, it's different every time. We just saw this on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. The believers have been praying for a while. And no one's laying hands on anybody, but all of a sudden, everybody's filled with the baptism and they speak in tongues. The Samaritans, in chapter 8 of Acts, uh, Peter and John, two leaders of the church, go to them and they lay hands on them. There's no mention of time frame. We don't know how fast or how slow it took. It seems pretty instantaneous, but that's how they received the baptism. Saul, in Acts 9, a leader of the church, lays his hands on Saul, now that we know him as Paul, and this is three days after Paul was converted. Uh, we don't have a time frame, but again, it seems pretty instant. The household of Cornelius at Caesarea in Acts chapter 10. Peter's not even, they're not even praying. Peter's preaching. And as he's preaching, uh, Cornelius, his, his family, they just start back, being baptized in the Holy Spirit and they start speaking in tongues. So there's not even praying that's going on. It's instantaneous. And then there's disciples in Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. Paul lays his hands on them and that is very clear. It's instantaneous. So why do I share all that? To say, I don't know how the Holy Spirit does it. He does it however he sees fit. I've heard stories of people going home in their bed, in the shower, in the car, all sorts of different places that people, that people have received. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to give you an opportunity to come forward, and the leaders of our church and our prayer team are going to do one of the things that takes place in the scriptures, laying on of hands. It's just a way of saying, look, we're going to pray for you. And uh, we're going to ask that you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. We're not going to we're not going to tell you to sit, to spell Coke backwards. E K O C E K O C. That's it. No, it's not. That's stupid. That's that's dumb. I'm no, I say that because there's been a lot of that in Pentecost, and it's ridiculous. No, that's not it at all. The Holy Spirit, I believe, wants to baptize you. That's, that what happens there is when people get the gift in front of the giver, and that's silly. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to pray a prayer of faith. And we're going to ask the Holy Spirit baptize you. And we're going to believe that when he does, that the result of that will take place, that the tongues will come.